I, uh, just through preparations for the workshop, have seen that video several times and it doesn't get old. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. We're really excited to uh, have you join us as we've worked really hard on this platform. I hope you're, you're seeing that and understanding that in the last one to two years, we've put a lot of effort into developing uh, this platform. And so we're excited to release this today uh, and just talk to you about all the things that went into that. Uh, I am going to discuss some of the life cycle of the work we've been doing and specifically on the beta test cycle that we ran with external stakeholders. And I'm so excited that Justin is one of my co uh hosts for this particular session of the workshop. Um, you just heard from him, which was powerful and wonderful. I hope you're enjoying all of our patient profiles. I'll talk a little bit about him as well, and then uh, we'll get to hear directly from him in this session. So excited about that. Uh, like I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been focused on in the last few years and what the development life cycle has looked like for us specifically the testing that we've done and including external stakeholders. And then uh, how through that cycle, we were able to identify a test case, which is where Justin comes in um, and how he was able to utilize the platform. He's going to show you end to end how he worked within RDCA DAP to actually do a test case of research around Duchenne's multiple dis uh, multi Sorry, I'm just going to say DMD because my tongue's tied a little bit. Forgive me. Um, and some research he did on the six minute walk test for that. Presenters here today, you've met Justin. You just saw his wonderful video, which was wonderful. I I just keep loving it each time. Uh, as he said, he's currently a student at Worcester Polytech and he's pursuing a combined a bachelor and master's degree in bioinformatics and computational biology. So from a beta standpoint for a technical data and analytics platform, he's just a gold mine. He was a perfect fit for uh, what we were looking for. Also with us today is Megan Calla, who is our own here at CPATH. And while by training, she is a chemical engineer here at CPATH, she develops quantitative solutions such as disease progression models, placebo response models, model-based clinical trial simulators, and lots of other things. So that made her a perfect fit within our development team at CPATH for uh, putting the platform together and giving us that insight and perspective from a quantitative medicine uh, standpoint. She was also the perfect fit then for kind of acting as a liaison with Justin through his, um, his use case and his research and uh, is available with us for Q&A at the end to help us go through some of those questions and field some of them as well. So we'll go ahead and jump in. Uh, like I said, I want to spend a moment just helping everybody understand if, if you don't have experience in a software and development background, some of the things that go into that particular process that got us to where we are today, but is also going to take us in the next upcoming years. So when you have an idea or you need to develop a solution, it, it starts with requirements analysis. This is when you spend time surveying your stakeholders, customers, or end users to determine what the software needs to provide, how the solution should look, how would it be used, and maybe what are the inputs and outputs that need to be accounted for. Once you've gathered all of that, you move into a design phase, which is where you develop architecture for the solution framework for what that's really going to look like. You can outline or identify hardware and software uh, requirements or system requirements that will be needed and necessary to support that. Uh, and then once you've done all of that foundation work, you move into implementation. That's where you write the code. You actually create the product or the solution based on the requirements uh, and the design planning that you vetted in the first two phases. Beyond that, you move into testing, where you validate that the code meets the requirements and the architecture that have been outlined uh, and report any issues found. You want to make sure you're looking both at technical issues, where a system may crash or you get an error, but also usability issues, because they're just as important. You want to make sure that the end users, the stakeholders in your game, are going to find value in what you develop. We're going to come back to that testing because that's what we'll focus on more directly here. But 
after testing, uh, you go into maintenance and enhancement. And in maintenance, this is where the software is released and delivered to a customer or uh, released to the general public, much like we're doing here today. Yay, we're excited. Um, but when this happens, inevitably new issues arise. Some issues are um, enhancement type issues where you just see an area that could be improved or you want to add more functionality, make it a little better. Some issues have to be addressed immediately because the system is giving errors or not performing adequately. Uh, when you have issues that are maybe enhancements or functionality development, those tend to go into a future development plan uh, or roadmap looking forward. Whereas obviously the more uh, pressing issues have to be taken care of immediately. So all of this touches on what we've been going on and what we will continue to work on and focus on. Um, we've got a lot in the pipeline for future enhancements and uh, uh, just developing things, tools and, and new features that we want to add. Uh, but we know that after today, you guys are in this with us now. You may find an issue, you may have a question, something that we can address, and that's part of this process. So like I said, I want to look specifically at testing. Uh, and while there are many different types of testing that happen within the iterative life cycle of software development, um, beta is a very specific one we're going to look at a little more in depth. This is where um, final customers or a representation of what your final customers and stakeholders look like. Do some validation and some testing before you hit that maintenance stage, before it goes out to the public. Um, and they use it in their own real environments. So we can identify a little more of those variations we can't really account for internally during development. And overall just gets a wider spectrum of eyes and experiences within the solution you're developing to uh, identify new combinations and how well the software performs under that particular, those particular situations. So that user feedback really either validates the path you're on and shows that the system you're developing will solve the problems you want it to solve or allow you to pivot before releasing it and make some changes in the path you're taking. For our beta test in the RDC ADAP development team, we approached stakeholders from several groups uh, that would be utilizing RDC ADAP upon its release. Uh, we looked at patient platform groups and patient groups in general, those in the academic setting, uh, data science and quantitative medicine, and really got a good mix for stakeholders who we hope to see really utilizing the platform heavily one day. We approached them and shared our vision for RDC ADAP and what we were hoping to accomplish, which you've seen and heard all morning and all afternoon long. And you got to see a lot of that in the demonstration that Aridia just provided as well. And then lastly, we outlined expectations for this beta test. Um, we needed to make sure we had people who were actively engaged in providing us feedback completing assigned activities and giving uh, information when something wasn't working, entering tickets and sharing constructive feedback. Uh, within those activities, we had a wide spectrum of ways we wanted to engage with our testers and draw feedback and input out of them. We ran our beta period from April 12th to May 7th of this year. Um, and during that time, we had many different types of live meetings and office hours where we could engage directly with beta testers. Uh, we offered tutorial videos to help them engage. Those same tutorial videos are available for all of our potential users moving forward as well to help onboard and understand the platform before you dig in. We assigned structured test cases, but we also encouraged a lot of ad hoc testing. Do your own thing. What would you be trying to do to make sure we were getting those new perspectives that we might not have accounted for? And then at the end, of course, we gathered information in a more structured um, format through a post beta survey. We learned a lot through that survey. We had some great feedback around things that we're doing well, we're on track with, validating the path 
that we're on and also identify some areas where we needed to do better and things we could improve before we achieved uh, our go live, which is today. People really liked the use of the metadata that Andrew showed in the demonstration where you could look at the catalogs and the dictionaries, really understand the metadata level of what you were going to get if you requested access to those particular data. Found data easy to find and intuitive with a, a nice, um, everybody's used to like a, a Google-esque type of um, search feature for keywords and then populating those databases on that. Um, and then some of the tools that we already have integrated, the R console, virtual machines, uh, the built-in analysis tools that you saw in the demonstration, those all ranked really, really well. Uh, we also found some areas where we needed to improve. We identified some latency issues, um, some ways that virtual machines could be more uh, useful out of the box with pre-installed software and tools, um, and some things that maybe weren't as intuitive as we'd have liked them to be. And we encouraged that feedback and that input. Justin was, like I said, just the perfect fit for uh, filling that role and going through this beta process with us uh, and providing that feedback. He already has experience as a developer and a tester. So uh, his, uh, his time to fit in and really grasp what we were trying to accomplish was really small small learning curve there. He also offered a really strong research perspective because of his history and his past, much of what you heard in his patient profile. And the areas of study he's chosen to pursue in his life have given him a real natural adaptation to what we're doing with RDC ADAP in this platform. Um, and his personal connection to rare diseases and research around that specifically just made him, like I said, the gold mine for our beta process. Uh, but through this, it provided the opportunity to identify a use case for uh, running through from the time you look for data to the time you complete research, um, what could be done within the platform. And his results are really exciting. I'm so excited that he's going to share this with you today. Uh, it gave deeper levels of tool validation and input for our team as we develop and move forward, but also highlighted, like I said, it wasn't all roses. And you're going to see that because we've asked Justin through his presentation here in just a moment to share with you what he saw during beta as he was going through that and the feedback he's provided to us that have helped us either make changes in the platform or populate that roadmap going forward, like I discussed. And really uh, just showcases why we're all here today, why we're sharing all of this information with you, and why we're, we hope you'll be just as excited as we are. And that is creating an area where accessible data and tools will foster deeper research, lead to disease understanding, and uh, more adept diagnosis processes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Justin because he's the star of the show right now, and I want to get over to him. Justin, go ahead and, and spend another moment talking about yourself and how you came to be with us here at CPATH in the beta test and what you were able to do completely within the platform. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Vicki. Um, and again, thank you for having me uh, to beta test the platform and speak today. Um, so I am Justin Moy. I am from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and I'm currently a senior there, again, pursuing a combined BS and MS in bioinformatics and computational biology. Uh, I was really excited to get to work with the RDCA-DAP platform. Um, and again, I was able to get to this point, again, through a series of um, connections. I served as Muscular Dystrophy Association National Ambassador from 2018 to 2019. Uh, and during that time, I had the opportunity to go to their uh, clinical and scientific conference uh, where I met Dr. Mahasweta Gergenrath, who happened to work on my own disease, MDC1A. Um, and during my time at WPI, I knew that eventually I did want to pursue and begin research in the neuromuscular disease area. So when it came time, 
to start my senior project or MQP, as we call it here at WPI, uh, I decided to reach out to Dr. Gergenrath, who put me into contact actually with uh, Dr. Jane Larkendale from CPATH. Um, and now uh, she's moved on from CPATH now. She actually got me involved in the beta testing and I was happy that it really lined up well with the timeline regarding the start of beta testing and then into my senior year. So although I have MDC1A, I decided to focus primarily on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And the reason for this was because of the data availability in the RDCA-DAT platform, as well as its uh, higher prevalence uh, among the rare disease community. Uh, it affects about one in 3,500 males, as it is an X-linked disease that's caused by a frame shift mutation that's due to exon deletions. Uh, as you can see here, it's caused by a mutation that leads to either a non-functional or truncated dystrophin protein. Uh, and dystrophin is really responsible for connecting the sarcolemma uh, of the muscle cell, which is its membrane, uh, with the actual actin protein itself. Uh, and this is what's responsible for muscle contractions. So over time, what you see in this disease is uh, decreased um, strength, as well as damage to the actual sarcolemma itself. Um, there are currently treatments at market. Um, however, these involve exon skipping. And I wanted to take a look overall at uh, different endpoints regarding this disease, specifically the six minute walk distance test. So what was the DMD data set in RDCA-DAP? Um, this actually came from the Duchenne Regulatory Science Consortium, uh, which is a different initiative by CPATH. Uh, however, of the seven data sets that comprise D-RSC, the CPATH itself, or sorry, the RDCA-DAP itself had five of these uh, data sets. Uh, what was really nice about these was that they were standardized into STDM format, which made a study across different of these studies here uh, very easy to use. Um, again, this data set was made up of longitudinal studies, patient reported questionnaires and databases, uh, as well as other academic databases. So after getting the data itself from the FAIR uh, data platform, which was very easy to use and very intuitive, uh, one of the first tasks that I found uh, that I had to do was a lot of data pre-processing. Um, although the data in FAIR was already curated, there were a few errors uh, that needed to be fixed. Um, a lot of these, again, were typos in the data between different data sets. That meant that when you were trying to aggregate it, uh, they would come across as different categories, even though they were the same test. Uh, additionally, one huge issue which I found was that uh, standardly, uh, the RDCA-DAP platform imports the data sets as .csv files or comma-separated value files. And oftentimes with these files, uh, comments uh, also contain commas in them, which led to improper number of columns, which again for uh, processing and analyzing that data led to errors. Uh, so first I decided to start with the virtual machine. And I started with the virtual machine for actual um, data pre-processing because, again, that's what I felt most comfortable with. In the platform itself, there was Linux and Windows. I decided to go with uh, Windows as my choice of virtual machine. And what I found with this was that it was very easy for file renaming. Again, oftentimes when you're um, aggregating data, correcting things, you want to save this new corrected file uh, just so you have a copy of the original data. And Within the platform itself, there was no easy way to rename files. So opening up this VM was a great way to do that, again, just through the file explorer. The other great thing about this virtual machine was the access to different IDEs uh, or integrated uh, development environments. Um, and these were great for using R code, Python, and other various languages. I particularly use Spider. Uh, for Python. And again, this was great because it was familiar, it was easy to use. However, in the virtual machine itself, internet access was uh, highly uh, restricted. So oftentimes you'd find that you'd want a library to use for analysis, but because of the restricted internet access, it wouldn't necessarily be, be able to install. Um, again, if we look at this here, 
uh, we can start to see the cons. Um, in this, this is a script that I wrote in the Spider IDE to remove the commas from comments. Um, however, due to the way that files are stored and the file system resets, we can see that while I stored the script itself in the file system that's shared with the RDCA-DAT platform, the Spider IDE itself was stored in the C drive of the uh, virtual machine. Uh, and in this case, what ends up happening is everything except for the shared file system with the platform resets. So you can see that here I was only able to open it in a text file. In addition to this, there was very slow feedback and a lot of latency with the virtual machine, which made it incredibly hard to work with. Again, if you wanted to work quickly, if you wanted to work efficiently, which is why I decided to move on to the uh, Jupyter Notebook, which was part of the mini apps. And I thought that the mini apps uh, were a really big strength with the RDCA dash dat platform. Um, here, again, in this video, this was a script that I wrote to consolidate functional test categories. And the Jupyter Notebook within the platform works exactly like a normal Jupyter Notebook would. Uh, again, it has faster feedback because you're not opening up a virtual machine. Uh, and again, um, the Jupyter Notebook shows uh, how easy it is to basically either install pre-made mini apps or write your own custom mini apps. So again, if you want to have your own analysis pipeline in the platform, uh, the mini app was a really great way to do that. Uh, however, again, with some of the pre-built mini apps, it was a little bit harder to install. Uh, the file size was very large and during the install process, I found that I would run into errors, uh, which I thought meant that the program was stopping. However, uh, after waiting a significant period of time, it was finally able to be installed and actually be used despite the errors, which would uh, show the contrary. Uh, additionally, at least with the Jupyter Notebook itself, it was only compatible with R and Python, which again limits the languages and familiarity that you might have if you are using the virtual machine. But overall, these were two great ways to um, pre-process the data and to get it into a point where you could actually use the inbuilt analysis tools here. Uh, and I thought that this was great. You could either use them with the plain CSV files itself or with data tables, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, here you can see that I was uh, basically categorizing and doing a frequency bar chart of the different uh, functional tests. And here we can see why I decided to focus on the six minute walk distance test. Um, among the studies, we can see that there is a significant portion in two studies that contained uh, the six minute walk distance test. Um, and there were about 170 individuals in this test here that participated. And because it occurred in multiple studies, uh, I was really able to compare across different studies themselves. Uh, again, with the embedded analysis tool as shown in the earlier video, it was really easy to just send this to the R console itself. Uh, that way, if I want to make any modifications to this graph here in R, uh, it was really easy to do, or I just want to work with a specific data set in the R console, it was very easy to do without having to worry about the actual construction of uh, the data set. The other tool that I found incredibly helpful for data analysis uh, was the built-in SQL tool. Um, and this tool utilized uh, data tables, which could be converted um, from the CSV files. So in order to work with this, first you need to convert from the CSV to the uh, data table itself. And I found that in this case, um, one of the issues though was that in converting it, you were able to analyze the CSV, but if you created a custom view using the SQL, you would have to first create a database view and then convert it into a database uh, itself uh, in order to do the built-in analysis. Additionally, uh, when actually trying to create the custom view, one of the issues was that with the um, data or database view preview tool, 
uh, which allows you to actually see the head of the table that you're creating. Um, it would only work once. So let's say that I made a mistake in the SQL here and I got an error thrown at me. Then I would have to close out of this tool, then reopen it and then re-enter in my corrected code in order to actually see the database preview and see if I was uh, correct in my syntax. And I found that to be an error that really caused a lot of slowing down. Um, additionally, although you were able to use data tables uh, with the built-in analysis tool, uh, the size that was allowed for that analysis was lower in the data tables than the CSV. So oftentimes I would find myself having to reconvert back from data tables to uh, the CSV in order to actually perform the analysis. So let's actually get into the demographics themselves. Uh, here you can see the distribution of ages by study. Um, and overall, there were about 4,229 uh, participants in all of these studies combined. However, because I wanted to focus on the six minute walk test, um, I filtered those out and found that um, there were only about 170 individuals with a average age of 8.85 years old. So I've been talking about the six minute walk distance test. Uh, what exactly is the six minute walk distance test? Again, it's very straightforward and it's uh, basically measuring the distance that is walked in six, sorry, in six minutes. And in both of these tests, they are measured in meters um, and measured at these time points here relative to the study start. So here we can see that we have um, distance walked relative to days of study start. And we can see that in DMD 1005, which was just one of the studies, uh, versus DMD 1012, we have a greater variance in the values for distance walked. However, uh, in both studies, we can see that they are measured at one, two, three, four, five different time points about at the same time. Um, so looking at this, it doesn't really show much. So I decided to separate the actual time uh, versus distance walked by age. So in the first bin, we have groups younger than eight years old. In the second, we have eight to 10 year olds. And then in the third, we have older than 10 year olds. And we can see here that among uh, less than eight and eight to 10 year olds, the six minute walk distance test over time uh, remains uh, very consistent. However, here uh, in the older than 10 year olds, we can see uh, that the six minute walk test distance starts to decrease. Um, again, we can also see this based on the data density in the lowest curve. So here we have very dense data as shown by the um, smaller gray portion around the line. But again, in the older than 10 year olds, we can see a greater um, gray area, which indicates that there was less data density at this point, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later as a general trend. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to focus on was respiratory metrics. And the reason that I decided to do this is because, again, in other diseases, uh, we see that the six minute walk distance test uh, is used in conjunction with respiratory metrics, uh, particularly in diseases like COPD. Um, so I decided to primarily focus on FEV1 over FEC. So to break this down, first, FEV1 is the volume of air exhaled in one second. Um, and then force vital capacity or FVC is the total volume of air exhaled. So FEV1 over FVC is basically the ratio uh, between the two and measures how much of your total air you can get out in that one second. Um, again, here I decided to show FEV1 over FVC over time with days relative to start. And compared to the first, uh, graph that I made where we had uh, days relative to start and six minute walk distance tests, where in both studies, the time points measured were consistent here. We can see that in FVV1 over FVC, the uh, 
only time points measured in DMD 1005 were these two time points at the start and then again over here towards the end, whereas DMD uh, 1012, there were more time points measured for this. Here again, we can see if we break it up by age, the FEV1 by FVC over time remains very consistent um, in the younger than eight group as well as the eight to 10 years group. Uh, however, in the uh, older than 10 group, we can see a slight increase here, but again, because of the lack of data in between, um, again, we can't really say that much. So next I decided to take a look at age versus total walk distance. Um, and here we can see that among the DMD 1012, which had younger participants, the total walk distance actually increases um, over time. Whereas with the DMD 1005, which had older individuals, we can see that the walk distance decreased here, uh, which is consistent with uh, disease progression. Um, again, if we look at age versus FEV1 over FEC, we can see that FEV1, again, decreases uh, with age in both studies. Um, however, we can see that there's a higher variance of data here um, as shown by the scatter plot. Again, if we look at uh, FEV1 over FVC versus total distance, uh, we can see that around an FEV1 over FVC of one, we see a clear uh, positive increase here um, between the two. And again, this is where the data was the densest. Uh, however, uh, as um, the data reaches extremes on both ends, we see that there is uh, less data, which makes sense. So overall, I wanted to talk about my conclusions, first regarding the platform, and second regarding the data analysis. So for uh, the platform, I found that it was incredibly useful for uh, data inbuilt data analysis, as well as pre-processing and cleaning of the data. However, it was limited by both speed and the size of the data sets that you're using. Um, but overall, uh, despite all of this, having multiple ways to complete the same tasks was useful because if in one area, uh, say you ran into an issue, then you could try to use another method to uh, get around that issue. As far as the data analysis was concerned, um, I found that data was very lacking, um, especially in the group that I use, for ages uh, greater than 10. So greater than uh, 10, that 11 years and older group. Um, but I did find that increased FEV1 over FVC um, had a little bit of a correlation with increased walk distance. Um, but it was good to see that within, uh, except in individuals older uh, than 11, FEV1 over FVC and walk totals remain consistent. Again, so this overall uh, shows the need to increase data accessibility. The more data in here, the better conclusions and stronger conclusions that we can draw. So thank you, um, and any questions? Thank you, Justin, for sharing all of that. And I'm hoping uh, that view of everything that can be done within the platform is ex is as exciting for you guys watching as it is for us. I know the first time I saw that, I thought, oh my gosh, we're actually making it. It's really working. So we we're really excited. And uh, hopefully you got to see a bit about how Justin's contributions to our team and providing that feedback became so important for our development process so that we could address those pieces and make the platform better when we got to uh, today, to release. And that, again, like I said, will continue in the, in the future years to come. Um, Megan, I know you've been kind of watching in the in answer section, so I'll uh, let you chime in with anything that people may be asking. Great. We had a, a couple of questions slash comments trickle in, so I'll, um, I'll kick it off with one from uh, Anna Lambertson. Um, apologies if this question's already been addressed. She says, uh, will the data in this effort include medical records or will this largely be limited to natural history data? So Vicki, I think um, you might be best suited yeah, to can, tackle that one. I can take that for sure. Um, I'm, I love 
of that question, actually. So right now we do have a lot of patient registry data, natural history data, and, and we're uh, grateful for that. We're developing APIs uh, directly to different patient platforms uh, as well to increase what's available. You'll hear more about that in just a few minutes as well. Uh, you've already heard about some of it today. But um, we are looking in the upcoming years to greatly expand the types of data available. We definitely want to look at EHR data, so electronic health data, uh, real um, medical records and bringing those in. We want to also look at genomics data. That's an area we're starting to focus on right now, as well as potential for including imaging data directly within the platform and the ability or the possibility um, we're starting to kind of review and dive into with Aridia, um, having an internally embedded image viewer, so a full a fully functional DICOM system, really, uh, so you can browse and um, analyze those images and the image series as well, as, and as well as, um, you know, the reports for those images and uh, those data as well. So those are areas we're looking moving forward to include more data types, expand the uh, uh, value, and um, depth of the types of data available within the platform. So hopefully, you know, as we move forward, a one-stop shop for lots of disparate types of data from all around the world. Um, so hopefully that, that answers that. Yes, thank you, Vicki. And another one came in. Um, this one's uh, for you, Justin. Could you comment on your experience with tracking um, provenance with the data that you presented? Uh, sure, I can talk a little about that. Um, again, so the data was uh, came from the uh, D-RSC. Um, however, within the platform itself, uh, the data was uh, anonymized, um, and you couldn't really tell from which study the data came from. And I found this to be a large issue itself because, again, you had all of these uh, data metrics, and then not knowing around how this data was collected or where this data came from um, made trying to figure out where to start with the analysis um, a little harder. Um, but again, knowing that uh, the data was anonymized was good for, again, protecting patient data um, and really being able to work ethically with the data itself. Thank you, Justin. And uh, maybe to, to follow up on, on that one. So as you were, um, developing these data analytics and visualizations. Um, I know that you, um, from working with you, you have a strong background in programming and were able to develop some of these uh, visualizations um, by coding them yourself. But for a user that perhaps might not have as strong of a background in the um, programming and the, the back end of things, um, where would you suggest or how might uh, those types of users find um, this platform to be useful? Uh, yes. Um, again, I have a background in writing this, but also, too, uh, the actual built-in analyses tools made it incredibly easy to produce um, just a lot of these graphs as well. Uh, being able to, again, just click Analyze Data, um, click on the columns that you wanted to analyze, and then have the built-in analysis tool produce that graph automatically for you and then show you that R code uh, would make uh, analyzing the data very easy for somebody uh, that may not be as familiar with programming. Thank you, Justin. Um, and maybe, Vicki, you could help address this one. I can give my two cents as well. But how often are these rare di disease sets in SDTM. It seems like that was a big step, a big help from the start that they were already standardized in SDTM. Well, that's not wrong. I mean, standardizing the data, especially because it's coming from so many different places uh, with, I mean, you've got patients entering it, you've got clinicians entering it, you've got different systems, different platforms, um, lots of variables come into play there. So having data that standardized and level set across the board is key to being able to um, uh, interrogate and, and analyze and research those data. So uh, I, 
uh, on the topic of SDTM. Um, so a lot of data that we already have is formatted in SDTM because historically that's a lot of the way that we at CPATH have worked. So some of that's already done and gives us a leg up. Uh, but we're also really strongly evaluating uh, different standards as well. Uh, one of the things I think Ramona mentioned or someone previously mentioned that we are working in partnership with the EJPRD, the European Joint Program for Rare Disease, on identifying, especially specific to um, patient registry data, which we have a lot of access to, and we've already, through our relationship with Nord, been able to um, bring in and make accessible within the platform. OMOP is one of the standards that's been identified as really being beneficial for those type of data because it can be, it's a queryable format, uh, and so it gives a little more flexibility and functionality to making those data useful. So uh, whether it's SDTM, whether it's OMOP, having an agreed upon standard within the platform is key. And that's what we're working toward right now. And a lot of the efforts in curating and cleaning and standardizing those data is going into exactly that. So that's a, a great question. And when you come to the platform, those data will be readily usable because of that. Thank you, Vicki. And back to you, Justin. Um, were there any analytical tools that were not available to you that you were able to either access or would like to see in future um, iterations of this platform? Um, definitely. Uh, I think that, again, a section that I really enjoyed was the uh, SQL uh, tool itself. However, I think that being able to uh, create database views uh, without actually having to make it take up space. Again, a way to better visualize uh, the SQL queries would be a great tool to have. Again, uh, having to switch from databases to database views back to databases or to CSV files uh, was incredibly slow um, and it took up a lot of time making sure everything was in the right format. So being able to, I guess, combine all of those things into one more easily usable tool would be a great addition that I would like to see in the future. And maybe to piggyback off um, in our last minute here, Vicki, um, for, for, uh, as this platform um, is being launched today, is there a mechanism in place for um, future users to give feedback or suggestions and um, how, how is that, um, or is there anything like that in place? Absolutely. And I'm just realizing as we did introductions, I uh, kind of glossed over myself. So I'm the project manager for the DCC, the Data Collaboration Center at CPATH. And part of that means it's my uh, job to gather information like that and keep things within the development moving forward and on task. And so that type of information is absolutely crucial moving forward for how we want to uh, shape development in our road path. And so uh, within the platform itself, as well as in kind of our landing page or portal that'll be available to everyone at the close of, of the conference today, the workshop, um, there is an op there's a, an icon, an opportunity to provide feedback or contact support. So clicking directly on that support link will get you there. Uh, all of our contact information is also provided and available as a result of this workshop. I am always uh, happy to take those emails directly and triage them and funnel them into um, whatever makes best sense for the development of the platform. So we want to be very available and, and open to hearing those types of feedback. So it can be done through contacting uh, support directly from within RDCA DAP or the landing page where all of the information about the platform is available or by contacting any one of us on the dev team who have maybe presented here today, uh, our, our cohorts at Iridia, myself as the project manager, I'm happy to receive that information. Thank you. And we are just about out of time. So I'll once again, thank Vicki and Justin for their um, vital roles in the continued success of this platform. Thank you. Thanks so much, Megan.